Okay. Zweet Kuber. All right. Thanks, Josh. Uh, good morning, and thank you for coming to uh, see our presentation and demos today. We have a couple of very exciting things to show you related to battery technology. So Kuberg is a startup based in the Bay Area, spun out of Stanford originally a couple years ago. We're developing a next generation battery technology that is ultra lightweight and extremely safe. And we think it has a number of very impactful applications for the US Army. The problem with lithium ion batteries currently is pretty well known to the Army. They're too heavy. Soldiers carry 15 to 25 pounds of batteries on a typical 72 hour mission. And it really is a significant weight and also safety challenges, which prevent us from going to higher energy batteries that uh, can power electronics for longer periods of time. Energy and safety are the two main issues with battery technology. Kuberg has a new chemistry, which I'll talk about more later, but from a very high level, it pr uh, presents 80% more energy for a given amount of weight and volume compared to lithium ion batteries. And this is not some sort of nebulous claim. We've actually built actual commercial prototypes. You can weigh them, you can measure the energy, and they do deliver 80% more energy than the best lithium ion batteries in the world today already. Uh, also greatly improved safety. We've done all kinds of abuse and safety tests, nail puncture, overcharge, overheating, uh, short circuiting, crushing them and so forth. Extremely safe, much better than most uh, lithium ion chemistries out there today. And this technology, perhaps most importantly, beyond the performance and safety benefits, is that it is extremely easy to manufacture. We can leverage the entire existing manufacturing ecosystem of the lithium ion industry, which means we don't need to redeploy all that capital, build out new equipment. It's actually a contract manufacturing approach that makes it very easy and simple for us to scale up. So uh, I know you guys are really excited about Army applications and about the demos that we're gonna do, so I'm gonna start things off uh, with some of the really exciting stuff that we have for you. So we identified two uh, most promising areas for Kubrick's battery technology with the Army. The first one is in future vertical lift, and you know, beyond, I guess, just typical helicopters and so forth, there's all kinds of other vertical lift that are of interest to the Army. I've identified a few of them over here. Electric flight, broadly speaking, is where batteries intersect with uh, vertical lift. One example is something like this man-portable electric uh, UAS, unmanned aerial system. Uh, this one, I believe, is an air environment Puma that's typically used by soldiers in the field. It's a backpackable model that you assemble, it has batteries in it, and then you, you basically toss it, and then it flies for a period of time, a couple hours, and it can do surveillance uh, for soldiers out in the field, but uh, limited by how long it can fly because of the weight of the batteries. Other potential future applications for electric flight with the Army, uh, for example, Boeing is currently making one platform called the Cargo Air Vehicle. This is a really large octocopter, eight propellers that can carry several hundred pounds of cargo, electrically powered, can fly with our battery technology up to 45 minutes at a time, and great for uh, delivery and logistics um, for that last mile into, into the, the battlefield. Uh, even more future thinking, uh, autonomous electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Uh, if you have looked at the um, Uber Elevate, for example, uh, this is um, in the consumer space where a lot of these things are heading, but certainly all kinds of army applications for this kind of autonomous vehicles that can uh, shuttle passengers or cargo uh, into battlefields without exposing soldiers to risk, and also much, much quieter and more stealthy compared to conventional helicopters. And so all of these rely on much improved battery technology. None of these technologies are really um, that viable with existing lithium ion batteries. You need something that's much lighter weight to really enable the flight times and mission profiles that you want for Army applications. And so based on, these, uh, on this vertical, we thought about what is the most interesting demo we can possibly do. Uh, back in October in our phase three, we presented these opportunities, but we didn't have a demo in mind yet. And since then, we figured out the best possible demo. And if you think about batteries, what you need out of them is you need reliability, you need very high energy, and you need very high power, which means it can power something that's extremely intensive. And if your battery can do all of that, then you have proven out all the performance metrics that you need to power really any sort of application. And of these applications, actually the most strenuous one is something similar to that cargo air vehicle, because it's an entirely vertical takeoff and landing aircraft which means that's extremely energy intensive, very weight sensitive, and also requires large amounts of power to, to actually do that vertical takeoff with those propellers. And so we actually took our battery, which uh, last October was about TRL five or so, and we've actually leapt ahead substantially. We're now at TRL seven, and we have a working functional battery pack assembled with commercial uh, prototypes, and this can actually power a drone with very, very interesting flight times. So, so the first uh, part of my demo is I'm just gonna show this around. 
It's still an early engineering prototype. It's basically two pieces of carbon fiber board with a couple of binder clips uh, attached to it to, to apply a little bit of fix, uh, pressure to the cells. But you can see in there is a stack of our cells. We have um, nine cells in there in parallel and in series. And so this, this battery, uh, pretty lightweight, but it stores a tremendous amount of energy for powering a drone. And so even with this early engineering prototype, which does not have an optimized pack design, it's really a very early crude uh, prototype for now, can already power a drone for 70% longer flight time compared to one powered by lithium ion battery. It's a generational leap in performance. And in fact, what's so unique about this is if you have looked at the battery industry, you've seen probably a lot of companies making big claims. But in fact, if you actually look online, nobody has ever demonstrated successfully a vertical takeoff drone powered by a next generation battery. Uh, typically, it's because they have very high power, but low energy, or they have very high energy, but low power. We're the first company that's successfully done this with the next gen chemistry that can deliver both at the same time and actually fly a, a commercial product with much better performance. So this video is basically a comparison of those two uh, vehicles, one powered by lithium ion and one powered by Kuberg's lithium metal battery. And so this is uh, not sped up, so it's gonna be flying essentially in real time. And I'll just explain what you're gonna see. On the left is a drone we took a video of with lithium ion, and then on the right is one powered by Kuberg's lithium metal battery. And so this is the first ever uh, demonstrated flight with a next-gen chemistry. Uh, successful takeoff and successful flight, and that's also what we're gonna show you later today here in this cage as an actual real-life uh, real demonstration with our battery pack. So I'll just leave this running throughout the presentation, and you can just watch it occasionally and see how long they fly. I won't spoil it ahead of time, but you can, you can check it out. Um, and I'll hand this over to Roger so he can set up our drone for the demo at the end of the presentation. So that is a, a vertical lift application. The other really exciting application is in soldier lethality. And this really uh, corresponds to the fact that soldiers these days are carrying increasing numbers of electronics and equipment on them that need, are very power hungry and need batteries. Uh, so night vision goggles, increasingly um, augmented reality is a really big area of innovation for the Army. Um, also certainly robotic mules for carrying uh, payloads exoskeletons, all of these are coming online. All of them are very power hungry, weighed down by the weight of lithium ion batteries. If you look typically at what soldiers use for uh, portable power, it's typically most commonly, the, the one on the left, the BB2590, is the most common rechargeable battery pack that soldiers carry. And they might carry on the order of five to 10 of these things into the field. And so each of these um, can be used to power a variety of communications equipment, and uh, other types of um, use cases. Conformal, we conformal wearable battery is one that's now starting to come online. Um, and it's a little lighter, but still has a lot of the challenges from the lithium ion because it's using lithium ion cells. So the BB2590, I decided, you know, in terms of soldier portable power, this is the most meaningful demonstration because this is the most common single format for soldier power. And if you can have a product that fits into that exact same BB2590 drop-in solution, without any re-engineering, you just wire up with new cells, and you can deliver up substantial weight savings. It's a very, very clear demonstration of what we can do with our technology. So right now, it's used to power radios, robots, jammers. Basically, you can string these things up into multiple large size packs and power anything from small radio to a large uh, robot, for example, or an exoskeleton with these things currently. Soldiers right now already carry 15 to 25 pounds of batteries, they said, but actually, even Beyond this, the projections currently show that by 2025, energy use for a typical soldier is expected to double uh, for a typical 72-hour mission. And then they also are wanting to push the typical mission profile for dismounted soldiers beyond uh, 72 hours, which will also require increasing energy. And so if no improvements are made to the battery packs, we're talking about soldiers having to carry 50 pounds of batteries in five or six years time frame, which is obviously not viable. So we do need some, a, a leap here in terms of performance. And so, this battery right here is what we've mocked up. So this one on the left is a commercial BB2590 that we bought online from Brentronics, one of the typical army suppliers. And this one is one uh, with uh, essentially Kubrick's technology inside. So these two have the same energy, same performance, uh, but ours is significantly better in terms of weight and performance and safety. So our, our battery actually weighs only 1.8 pounds compared to 3.1 pounds. So it's a 40% weight savings in this format and also with significant safety improvements on top of that. 
So I'm just gonna show these around to you. You can feel the weight difference, and if you imagine you're carrying five of these at a time into the field, or seven of them, you can see how significant that is for the typical warfighter. And so we're pretty excited now to be working uh, with the Army. Um, this is uh, under CERDEC, where, where they do a lot of the battery work in the US Army, so for communications and electronics. And so we are pretty excited to start working with them in terms of supplying cells for evaluation, and hopefully integrating now into actual field testing, where the technology is essentially ready to be commercialized. The cells work, they have performance, they meet essentially all the performance metrics the Army is looking for, and we just need to start working with the Army to think about how do we integrate them, how do we actually test them in the field to see how they do in a, in a real life uh, condition. But fundamentally, the technology is delivering the weight savings, and so significant benefits for warfighters. So those are the, the two uh, demos we're gonna show, and I'm gonna leave our drone flight for the end of the presentation, so a nice Fino demo, which is uh, very exciting, but in the meantime, I'm gonna have to walk you through a little bit more about uh, what we've done in terms of where the company has been, how the technology looks like, and where it's going in the next uh, six to 12 months. Uh, this is only at four minutes or so, so they're gonna keep flying for a while to watch and, and see how that does. So, so the company, as I mentioned, uh, spun out of Stanford University in 2016 out of my PhD and my co-founder's postdoc work in the material science department there. We've been around for almost three years now. We have 10 full-time employees, top-notch technical talent from uh, um, top institutes and companies around the world. Most recently, last January, we closed a seed funding round led by Boeing's venture capital group, Horizon X Ventures, and Boeing has been instrumental in really working with us to take this to the next step. Beyond just money, they've been an excellent strategic partner uh, because they have all kinds of uh, uh, very interesting applications for batteries, especially as it pertains to drones, electric flight, and so forth. Um, and also, of course, a substantial uh, defense presence with Boeing. So a lot of uh, ongoing work with the company in terms of adapting this for, for defense and for commercial use. Um, long-term vision for Boeing is actually on uh, commercial airplanes. And so there, there's two long-term visions for them. One is this kind of urban vertical takeoff air taxi that everyone's talking about these days for urban mobility. And this requires uh, next generation batteries to work. Uh, Boeing recently demonstrated the first uh, flight uh, of their passenger air vehicle, vertical takeoff, but it only flies for a very short amount of time because the batteries are way too heavy. And so they need something like this to enable that to actually work. The other long-term vision for batteries with Boeing is actually hybrid electric flight for passenger airliners. And what, why this is uh, interesting is because, especially for short haul and medium haul flights, which are a significant percentage of flights in the US, uh, you can imagine that when your flight takes off, it's spending a lot of time climbing to, to top altitude, and then very soon thereafter, in a couple hours or one hour, it, it's then landing. So much of the time is spent either taking off or landing, and it really maxes out the use of the engines, but the engines are actually oversized for that takeoff load, whereas during the, the, sh the short cruise, it's using much less energy. And so a hybrid electric system, the benefit of this is it can take up all that slack and, and help to boost the airplane during the takeoff mode and during landing and provide enough power to do that, but you can actually undersize the engines and carry much less fuel for the uh, cruising portion of the flight. And so significant uh, benefits in terms of fuel savings for uh, future uh, planes. And certainly it's true for airliners, but also other types of short haul flights uh, where fuel was a big concern, uh, this is a really big benefit. So, so that's the long-term version in, in the aerospace industry for us. Uh, we've been supported by a number of federal and state grants. Uh, Cyclotron Road is a very interesting entrepreneurial fellowship program sponsored by Department of Energy at Berkeley Lab, half a million dollars, two years of mentorship, office and lab space, and we graduated from that August of last year. A number of other grants from Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, California Energy Commission, and of course, uh, US Army through the XTEC search so far. So the technology, and I'm diving into a little bit more about what makes this possible. Uh, the, the core invention of Kuberg is a new proprietary electrolyte. And this electrolyte, it's a liquid, uh, just like normal electrolytes are today uh, in batteries, but instead of the flammable uh, organic solvents that you use in lithium ion batteries, we have an entirely new formulation. It's a new set of non-flammable solvents, salts, and additives that's really tailored for a high-performance next-gen uh, battery system. And that uh, electrolyte ultimately allows us to make a battery that's both very, very high energy and very safe at the same time because of the non-flammable and thermally stable nature of that electrolyte. Everything else in the system is actually quite uh, straightforward, relatively, um, and that's actually what allows us to make so much progress recently because we don't need to reinvent the rest of the battery here. We're buying commercial metal oxide cathodes, 
Uh, they're processed in normal lithium-ion plants. We're buying commercial lithium-ion separators. We're buying lithium metal, which is also from the lithium battery industry. All commercial products, no supply chain risks. We can assemble all this together with existing contract manufacturers, and then all we do is put in our liquid electrolyte at the very end of the process, seal it up, and run some initial cycles to form the battery, and then you have a very high performance and safe battery technology. So your TRL assessment, is that a self-assessment, or was that independently verified? Uh, that, that's a self-assessment based on what we've done with the drones and so forth. Yeah. And so based on this technology, uh, already pr producing 80% more energy that's much safer, and as I mentioned, drop-in solution to lithium-ion manufacturing. That's really the, the key, because there are so many battery technologies out there, certainly in academia and also in industry, where people are making really big promises, things look interesting in the lab, but they cannot scale it up, or they need you know, $200 million, $500 million to build out their own big factory and, and lines and, and custom manufacturing and processing. We can avoid all of this by leveraging existing equipment, and that's allowed us to be uh, extremely uh, efficient, both with our time and, and with our capital. So in our lab, we already have an incredible amount of testing capability for high throughput electrolyte development and testing. It's um, rapid data collection. We probably test about 100 cells or more per week, uh, which is as much as companies that are 10 or 20 times our size are testing these days because of that contract manufacturing approach. And then we are developing now machine learning backend to actually analyze all the data that we're collecting to extract all the insights to further expedite this uh, rapid iteration of development. If you compare it to a couple other companies uh, in the Bay Area that are working on next-gen battery technologies, you can see they've raised on the order of 120 to 150 million dollars, but they're still making tiny R&D cells that are not that meaningful commercially, um, not that many of them, not very reliable, and they, don't, they aren't able to even make large commercial cells like we've already made at Kuberg in a fraction of the time and you know, a 120th or 150th of the money that they've spent. So extremely efficient because we have this pure electrolyte approach. It's very, very simple to integrate and everything else is basically already taken care of by the lithium ion industry. Uh, this is something uh, from the US Army that might also be interesting. It's an assessment of uh, core flammability properties of electrolytes. It's, it's something devised by the US Army Research Lab and it's called self-extinguishing time. And so you, you take a essentially separator, the porous separator, you soak it with a known amount of electrolyte and then you try to light it on fire and see what happens. And so if you look at you know, this video here, this is us lighting a lithium ion electrolyte on fire. So extremely flammable, it burns for quite a long time. And then if you calculate the amount of time per gram of electrolyte, then you get the self-extinguishing time. So anything above 20 is considered flammable and lithium ion is at 92, so extremely flammable, and that's what leads to a lot of safety concerns with lithium ion. Uh, we've gone through three generations of our electrolytes, uh, broadly speaking, in the past couple years, and you can see all of them easily classify as non-flammable. The threshold is six, our first generation is 2.4, second gen is 1.6, and version three now that we are now uh, validating and implementing is truly non-flammable. You cannot ignite it at all, you cannot combust it, it it's extremely stable. So. Uh, Non-flammable electrolyte ultimately is the core for what makes the system safe because fundamentally everything else in there is very high energy. You're packing in a huge amount of energy in a small space and to really make that safe you need an electrolyte that's fundamentally very, very stable so that you don't catalyze any kind of runaway reactions or, or flammability concerns. So this is a video that I showed um, last year. I'll just play it again uh, briefly. Um, or maybe not. But uh, basically we've done nail puncture tests of um, our cells, uh, very, very safe compared to lithium ion, but we've also done a lot of other standard tests. Um, UL 1642 is a standard certification for uh, consumer batteries, and, and you do a bunch of um, abuse testing over temperature, short circuit, overcharge, um, crush, and so forth, and over temper, uh, I mentioned over temp. Uh, and so on all of these metrics, uh, compared to uh, lithium ion cells, uh, substantially safer. And so we anticipate that this will also fairly easily meet uh, military standards for, for battery safety. Now, well, here, here's the video. So you can see it's uh, much, much better. <laughs> Lithium ion is pretty violent if, if you put a nail through it. So not, not, not the ideal chemistry. Uh, also in the past few months, we've made very exciting progress. So last October when I presented, we still had relatively small lab cells, about 0 0.6 amp hours that we were cycling and excited about. But since then, we've made a tremendous leap, scaled up about 8x in terms of capacity, and we're now at about uh, over four amp hours in capacity. And so that large cell is what allows us to prove out the energy, the power, and the cycle life. And so in that commercial format, we're actually cycling it almost 200 times uh, before it reaches end of life. And this is still with version two of our electrolyte. 
um, and already quite close to US Army standards for soldier batteries, which is typically 224 cycles, the typical specification. And with version three, we are anticipating about a 40% increase based on early uh, lab results. So we should already be there in terms of cycle life as well, which is one of the concerns the Army has had uh, with our technology. So already enough for soldier power applications and validated with real, real cells. Leveraging lithium ion ecosystem. So this is one example of um, you know, pilot scale production, but none of this belongs to us. This is all contract manufactured. So typical cathode coating processes. You have rolled roll uh, processing for separator, for lithium metal, for cathodes. It all comes together um, in either you know, cylindrical cells or these days more commonly we make pouch cells where they're stacked. Um, and a lot of the industry is moving toward pouch cells. Uh, but um, that's where we believe that the future is for battery technology. And the conformal wearable battery that the Army is developing is also based on pouch cells. So we can very easily integrate into that kind of an application. And so, so the business model for Kuberg is ultimately um, contract manufacturing. We're getting close to the point where something's gonna happen in the video in the next two minutes. So we'll, just, we'll just keep an eye on that. But uh, uh, our, our business model is really extremely capital efficient. Uh, and so we buy industrial materials from top suppliers around the world. All of the materials and components we use are already manufactured at very large scale at reasonable cost. So there's no scale of cost. We don't have to build large reactors. We don't have to synthesize our own chemicals. It's all readily available in the supply chain. We do the R&D and design, which is really our core competency and what we excel at. We outsource the fabrication of uh, dry cells. And what's so interesting about this is all the materials are processed and made externally in a existing lithium ion facility. And it's very, very high throughput. They can basically scale up to any kind of scale that we can imagine because they have huge factories making millions of cells per year or tens of millions of cells per year. So very easy pathway to scale up with minimal capital investment from us and very, very high quality as well at the end of it. So we're receiving these extremely high quality commercial cells from vendors, but the key difference is they do not have any electrolyte in them, so they're dry cells. And this is critical because it allows us to very, very cleanly separate the uh, proprietary knowledge and the IP and the know-how. And so all the stuff that we outsource, this commodity components, commodity design, we can make work with any manufacturer in the world. There's really nothing that you can steal there. Um, and then they, they take it to us, we take the dry cells and then we put in our secret sauce. Um, and that secret sauce, the electrolyte, then unlocks the full performance and safety characteristics of that cell. But that filling process only takes us two minutes in our lab, extremely quick, and then after that, you just seal it up and then put it on formation cycling for a couple of days, and then you have a cell that's ready to go commercially. So extremely efficient. And then after that, then we're, our model is to directly sell these cells to early customers in the defense and aerospace industries where uh, this is really already hi highly impactful. In the long term, our vision is that ultimately this will become a licensing model for large scale applications like consumer electronics, automotive, for example. We're not gonna have the capital to really build this out. And so that's when licensing or perhaps acquisition by a large battery manufacturer would make the most sense to really fully commercialize this technology. So you can see the lithium ion uh, drone has landed 15 minutes, 56 seconds for, for this little drone that we purchased off the shelf. And so the Kubrick cell uh, uh, battery uh, and the drone powered by the battery is gonna keep flying. So we're just gonna keep waiting and see how long it flies, but uh, it's pretty impressive. So ultimately, in terms of uh, commercialization vision, um, we already have this model worked out. We have contract manufacturers that have already made high quality cells. So this is all, uh, the pipeline is ready. We have all the facilities in-house in, in our labs in the Bay Area to fill with electrolyte and to do formation cycling. And then we're ready to sell these to customers. And so in terms of capacity, right now this quarter, we're already anticipating scaling up very substantially to at least uh, 500 cells in the next quarter. And 500 is a sort of a magical number because each customer is typically purchasing samples from us right now, maybe 10 to 20 cells for early evaluation. And so that 500 cells allows us to fulfill sample requests from all of this top, these top defense and aerospace customers that have already put in purchase orders for samples. And then next quarter, Q3, we're then ramping up to at least two to 3,000 cells in Q3. And that is early uh, pilot production levels for more meaningful demonstrations in large pack systems and so forth. And then by Q4, we're gonna be at more than 10,000 cells per quarter. And we already have all of the equipment and capability to ramp through the end of 2019 just in our current lab. And it's, it's kind of incredible to think about because we only have a you know, modest lab space, nothing that's really automated, but because it's such an efficient process, we can make 10,000 cells a quarter 
in our existing lab. And this is already pilot production that's a higher level than any next generation uh, battery technology company has achieved historically. And that's just in 2019. And by 2020, we will then, by end of 2019, we'll be building out a more dedicated facility to do electrolyte filling and um, formation in a more automated process. And then that will take us to meaningful production volumes by early 2020, tens of thousands of cells per quarter. So a very smooth um, ramp up plan. And really there's no technology risk. This has all already been validated. It's just a matter of building out the equipment, which all already exists as well, that we can just purchase off the shelf. And then you can just scale this up as much as you need. And so for a typical army application, for example, by 2020, we'll be able to supply production volumes of cells for those applications. And the other really attractive thing is because of our model, these cells are of US origin, they're US manufactured. And so that will fit into any kind of defense application that you need. And also gonna be uh, highly cost competitive because uh, we are outsourcing all the commodity components, but then we're doing the, the core technology and the finishing of the cells in house in the US in a very efficient way. So US manufactured, which uh, can allow us to drop this very easily into a variety of applications. So the, the drone is still flying. Um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I suspect it will still be flying. But I'm going to show you now a shortened version of this video to get you guys pumped up. And then we're going to do the live demo of our drone. So this is the, the shortened version, which, which you'll see right here. So this is the world's first vertical takeoff drone flown with a safe lithium metal battery. And so you can see, again, same video, but this is gonna be sped up. And so sped up 60X. So you can see the minutes on the bottom ticking away, ticking away. Kind of looks like an angry bee because we're flying outdoors and there's a bunch of wind. But uh, Roger, our uh, experienced drone pilot, <laughs> has uh, been able to keep it under control. It's much calmer indoors. Like in 16 minutes, the thing falls down, end of life. And ours keeps going, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 minutes until it lands. And so 70% increase in flight time, even with an early engineering prototype of our, our technology. When we, we anticipate once it goes into commercialization with a more efficient design, it'll be 90 to 100% increase in flight time compared to lithium ion. So this is a true, truly generational improvement in battery tech and disruptive innovation in uh, drone flight. So Roger is setting up now our drone. So this is the final part of our presentation and demonstration. So you know, if you guys want, feel free to stand up, uh, come take a look. Uh, before we start flying, I'll just show you what's going on. So this drone here is, is a, and also in the rest of the audience, if you guys are interested, you know, feel free to stand up. But uh, this drone is just a commercial drone purchased from uh, DJI, one of the top drone manufacturers in the world. And it's more of a hobbyist kit, so designed to actually be able to adapt, put in your own battery packs, program it yourself, so pretty easy to integrate. And then all this is, is we've put in our battery pack on the top there, the one that you took a look at earlier, and then with a controller, and then uh, basically this thing works. And so we have the power to do takeoff, which is actually a very, very high a takeoff power, that's the most stressful part of the flight. And then once it takes off and it hovers, then it can fly for about uh, almost 30 minutes um, and with this early, early prototype. So um, I think we're ready to go ahead. All right. So this is the world's first public demonstration of a vertical takeoff flight powered by a lithium metal battery. So. Uh, probably the biggest mi commercialization milestone we've reached at Kuberg thus far. And we were able to pull this together in only five months' time from October when we did our phase three XTEC search. So incredible progress. Um, Steven and Roger are the um, key engineers on this project, and just the two of them have been able to put this together in a matter of months. So um, we're very proud of what we've done, and we're very excited to work with the Army um, on future applications. So Roger will just let this um, hover here. Um, we're, we just don't want it to get it caught in the net because it would not be great. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the battery has been perfectly reliable uh, in all of the flights, but the drone is a slightly touchy in terms of the controls and so forth, especially flying in a contained space. But uh, yeah, pretty good indoors. So you know, happy to take questions, and we'll just keep this thing flying for uh, you know, however long you guys want until you guys get bored, but happy to take questions. What about recharge time? 
Yeah, so recharge time right now, uh, typically what we do in the lab is a three-hour recharge. Uh, what the Army specifies is typically a five-hour recharge uh, for their soldier battery, um, according to the normal specifications. So we're in the same range already. So you've mentioned a couple times exploring hybrid electric. Yes. And air taxis in the bigger systems. So do you envision getting up to the hundreds of kilowatts type area? Absolutely. So we're working with a number of companies, both in the air taxi area and also in the automotive space. So some of the top companies around the world. And they're already asking us, you know, when can we get 5,000 of these cells to make a 100 kilowatt hour pack for an early uh, concept vehicle, like a next, next gen high performance sports car that's electric. Um, so there's a couple companies in the world working on this. You can maybe guess who it might be. But uh, that, that's one of our potential customers. And then some of these other um, air taxi applications where they also want to buy several thousand cells by Q3 to test this out. So what about cycle life? So with recharge yeah. and having to recharge lithium ion, formation of dendrites, sure. and you know, short circuiting of eventually of the, of the battery, have you done extended uh, recharge cycles to, to yeah. look at the actual lifetime of a battery? Yeah, so right now with our version three electrolyte, we predict being at about 250 to 300 cycles based on what, what we've uh, shown earlier. Um, that's already uh, good enough for most early defense applications and also for all these drone applications. The typical commercial DJI battery is warranted for about 100 cycles because of the harsh use case. So uh, already plenty for all the early commercial markets, but as we go to large scale for automotive, for air taxis, for example, cycle life becomes more stringent, along with, of course, price for such a large scale application. And so those are term targets for us, maybe in the next three plus years, we anticipate getting into those markets. But the improvements in our electrolyte have really been very substantial. So we probably, we started out, I would say a year and a half ago with a cell that cycled about 30 cycles. And that's what you know, commercially most people were doing these days. And we were able to improve that to almost 250 cycles in a year and a half. And we still have a lot of headroom in terms of where we can grow. So we anticipate easily being to 500 cycles, which is, opens up most consumer applications, including things like smartphones and computers and so forth, um, in about one year time frame. And then 1,000 cycles is maybe two to three years out. Are there, any, are there any environmental conditions that impact like minus 40 to plus 140 Fahrenheit is yep. typical Army yep. field temperature range? Exactly. So the, on the low temperature side, we are about similar to sort of commercial off-the-shelf lithium ion batteries. The ones that the Army uses are, I think, specially tailored for ultra-low temperature. And so we're doing a little bit more development work to get to that ultra-low temperature. But we're, we're getting pretty close on that end. A high temperature is actually really great because of the thermal stability. So we can go to much, much higher temperatures than it typically can be done with lithium ion with no degradation of the chemistry. And so another example where this is great is especially for large, high, high power vehicles, something like, say, an air taxi, where you have a huge pack or a high performance car, uh, it's really cooling the battery that is the key challenge for uh, a manufacturer. Uh, because you have so much heat that's built up, so you need these complex liquid cooling systems, you need all this overhead to get the heat out. And we talk to these um, automotive manufacturers, they're extremely excited about the heat stability, because if you can operate comfortably at 140 Fahrenheit with no degradation, that means you can get away with a passive cooling system on your car, which is much lighter, much cheaper, and really makes the whole vehicle much, much more attractive. So especially for these very intensive applications, that, that high temperature is really the, the, the key uh, variable. So, so how does this compare to silicon anode technology? Yeah, so silicon anode is probably a more near-term technology. Uh, it's, it's also you know, relatively easy to integrate, but you know, that being said, a lot of the companies have already been around 10 years and still don't have a commercial product. Uh, we anticipate silicon coming online, especially for things like um, uh, smartphones and so forth, where it's all about the, um, the size of the battery, not so much the weight. And that's where silicon uh, re really shines. And so for those applications, I think silicon will be coming more and more online in the next couple of years. But at the same time, I think our chemistry is delivering much more energy than silicon can deliver, especially on a weight basis. So it's really a sin another generational leap beyond silicon, and with a lot of other benefits because of our non-flammable chemistry. I don't know if the question was asked. I know that the question was asked about cycle life, but what about uh, life cycle, like sitting on a shelf, shelf life? Sure, sure. So the chemistry is also quite stable in terms of shelf life, and so that's really because the, the, the it, so typically when you have limited shelf life, the problem is that that electrolyte, that flammable organic electrolyte, reacts with components in your cell. 
and then it forms basically these insulating layers, and then the battery starts to uh, fade in performance and power. And so with our chemistry, the, because the electrolyte's so much more chemically stable, both in terms of high voltage and low voltage performance, it means that shelf life is actually very, very good. So almost no self-discharge, and you can store it for many, many years at a time. Uh, it's, it's quite good. So you mentioned you're already interacting with CERDAC, I assume on the conformable soldier portable batteries. Mm -hmm. What's what's been their perspectives on the path forward with, with the batteries? Yeah, so so CERDAC has been historically worked with a num a few battery companies in the space. And so they have a number of, I guess, horses in the race, so to speak. And so they're working with those companies. We've been talking to them in the past couple of years about our technology. They're, I think, you know, understandably skeptical of new battery technologies given how much in the space is sort of overhyped and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they've been waiting for us to get to a commercial prototype that's pretty interesting in cycle life and so forth. And I think now we're there. So we're ready now to start providing samples to them. And once I think they can test our samples, then I think they're going to get very excited about next steps. Um, in, in terms of raw performance, so I think as mentioned, you know, cycle life was a concern, but we've now basically hit their cycle life targets. Power also was a concern, but we've easily exceeded all the power targets. The only thing left, I think, is in terms of a very, very low temperature, where we want to still do a little bit of work. And we've actually proposed, sent in a proposal, an SBIR proposal with the U.S. Army, with CERDEC, uh, targeted at low temperature. But, you know, hopefully uh, with a little bit more work with the Army, we'll figure that out, and then I think it's really ready to go. The Tank and Automotive Research Development Engineering Center, their new name, Ground Vehicle Development Command, I, I'm, I think, or Development Center, <clears throat> also does battery uh, applications for own vehicles. Have you, have you had any con connections with those guys? Not yet. So Tardec is one I've been wanting to pursue. Well, at, you know, a few months ago, we thought it was still a little far out because they're looking for hundreds or thousands of cells and weren't ready yet. But I think now we're getting pretty close to the point where, at least for early concept vehicles, they could actually do a development project. So that's an area we want to really push is, is with Tardec. For ground, for ground robotics especially, yeah. you know, a smaller, not a whole... Sure. Combat vehicle necessarily, but yeah, absolutely. For something like ground robotics, it's basically a, a, a lesser version of a drone in terms of power. So we can already power any kind of ground robotics pretty comfortably. And with after there, have you done any ballistics testing? Uh, we are planning to pretty soon, actually. So uh, actually, we just uh, next week we're going to be sending out 14 cells to Boeing, and so they're going to be doing their first testing. So they're doing sort of full FAA-type testing, which is much more aggressive than typical uh, safety tests. And I believe they'll also be doing a ballistic test for some of the more um, Air Force-related uh, applications that we have. So, okay. yeah, coming soon. I know it's a, it's a very strenuous test. It's like an armor-piercing incendiary round or something that goes through. So, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, we'll be doing that. So. Yeah, that's the worst-case scenario. Yeah, worst-case scenario. <laughs> are, are there any environmental hazardous aspects to your electrolyte. I mean, the right. battery technology, and I'm not an expert, I think creates a lot of byproducts that sure. may not necessarily be great for the environment. Is mm -hmm. yours more or less about the same? So, so actually, lithium ion te technology is actually pretty decent in terms of sustainability. So they don't have any heavy metals in them. They don't have you know, cadmium or lead or anything like that. Um, the recycling side of the thing, of, of the picture is something that the industry is seriously invested in now, because now that electric vehicles are really becoming commercialized, you're having you know, millions of cells potentially in a few years sitting in a landfill, and nobody wants that. So there's a lot of effort going into recy efficient recycling of lithium ion, and I think what's uh, really nice about our chemistry is because of the similarity to lithium ion, uh, you can actually use the exact same manufacturer, uh, uh, recycling techniques. And so obviously we don't have the resources to invest in recycling and development, but we can enjoy all the development that's going on in lithium ion. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.